Today, I'm gonna to walk you through some of the more common examples of what's new in Swift 5.3. Of course, a lot got added, as you can see here on the official uh, released site. You can look at the notes here, but if you wanna do a deeper dive into maybe some of the stuff I don't cover or just go deeper into the stuff I do cover, here's all the links to the proposals. You can really do a deep dive there. But again, I feel like not all of this stuff is gonna be very commonly used. So I'm gonna focus on what I feel is, you know, gonna be used by most people in their day to day. First up, let's talk about improved availability of self in escaping closures. Now, there's version's probably the wrong word, right? But there's a use case for Swift UI and there's a use case for UI kit. Let's start with the UI kit example first so you can see that, and then we'll do Swift UI. So here I have a pretty typical animation block, right? UI view.animate. And then as you know, in these blocks, you have to do self dot dark transparency view, self dot image view. I'm just animating the alpha of the images, right? Well, what you can do now with this new feature is anytime you capture self in a capture list, you no longer have to type it out here. Watch, so if I do self and then in, so now I have self and then now, quick trick, if you hold option in your cursor, you can multi-line highlight. So now I can just get rid of self here and do a command B real quick to make sure everything's all good. And there we go. So now cleaned up the code, no more selfs everywhere in your, your closures, if you, as long as you capture it in the capture list, as you can see uh, up here. Now for the Swift UI example, and the big thing here is that Swift UI uses a lot of structs, right? Value types, right? View is a struct. Well, you can't really have retain cycles in value types, right? It's not, it's not a referencing anything. So all this self here, right, self, well, that one's still needed, <laughs> but right, self dot, self dot, self dot, self dot. You see it littered in Swift UI code prior to this. And I actually tweeted this right here, how excited I was to finally be able to do this. Uh, and we moved to iOS 14 for this project. So now I can go back and watch. You just pretty simple, right? Just delete the self. Uh, delete the self, just gets rid of all that that clutter. I'm, I'm not a fan of, of unnecessary selfs in my code. I just don't like the way it looks. Um, I know this is repetitive, me deleting it, but I'm not gonna lie to you. It feels so good to just delete this, clean it up, get rid of all the selfs. And I know there's probably some quicker keyboard shortcut, delete all thing, chill. Um, but uh, the point is here, look, I mean, so much cleaner, just get rid of all that cluttered self all throughout your code. And that's new in Swift 5.3. Next, we're talking about improved control flow in Swift UI's function builders. And to demonstrate this, I'm gonna share a tweet by Malin Sundberg. She was the first person I saw doing this uh, on Twitter. Really liked her example. Here, I'm gonna blow up the code so we can dive into that, but wanted to give her proper credit. But a common issue in Swift UI is showing different things based on different values. Okay, I know that was vague. But you see down here uh, where she's showing her sheet, right? You wanna either show a sign in one or create account, right? That's pretty common uh, on a login screen. Well, now you can actually use a switch statement. So you're switching based off of uh, the case, either sign in or create account. And then you can see based on what button you tap up here, you're flipping that sheet type value to either sign in or create account. So before in the function builders, you could really only use if else, and it was pretty, pretty rudimentary, but you know, now we can uh, do more stuff with the switch statements. Moving on to enum synthesizing conformance to comparable. Uh, what that means now is you can compare two cases. Let me actually write some code to, to illustrate this. So the first thing you have to do is make your enum, uh, again, conform to uh, comparable. There you go. And real quick, this enum is like a player ranking enum, right? If you were going up a ladder in like a video game, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond. And that's the key here. The When you're comparing this and sorting based on this in an array, like this order is what matters, right? Like if I order this uh, platinum, diamond, bronze, gold, like if it was out of order, like that's the order you're telling it it is. So be careful what order you, you make it because that's, that's really what matters. But now that you can compare these values, you can do stuff like this. Say let minimum rank for match. And that is a player rank, whoop, not playground, player rank and equals dot gold. So you gotta be at least gold to play in this match. So now you can do, you know, function determine uh, qualification for rank and rank is a player rank. And you just do a simple little uh, if rank, you know, this is where you're comparing now. This is where the comparable conformance comes in. If rank is greater than or equal to minimum rank for player match, print uh, this player qualifies, else print learn to play noob, right? And then we can, a uh, nice toxic gaming culture, right? Determine qualification four, and let's say we'll do platinum, right? So if I run this, we're gonna get a printout here down in the bottom. And as you can see down here, this player qualifies. And if I change this to silver and run it again, 
learn to play a noob, right? So again, you're just comparing uh, the two cases. And again, the order matters, right? If I jumbled up this order, it, it's not gonna work out. And not only can you compare it now, you can also maybe, maybe you wanna sort an array of players based on the rank. Like maybe your player objects has a property called player rank, and it's one of these. And then you can you know, sort all your players based on player rank bronze, player rank silver, if you conform to this uh, comparable protocol. So that's new uh, in Swift 5.3. Now let's talk about multiple trailing closure syntax. It's caused a bit of a controversy on the Swift forums. Feel free to dive into that if you want. Probably a waste of time at this point. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but let's let's make some space here. I'm gonna use this button as an example, right? So this aspect right here, this scope, this is the trailing closure for this specific example. So now if you wanna have multiple of these, like you, you, you can leave this first uh, label if you want, this is optional, or you can remove it. However, you're, your attached uh, trail enclosures now have to have a label. So now I would do uh, label. Well, this just happens to be the name of the <laughs> parameter. Um, label was kind of like the generic term, right? You have to have something here saying what it is. Let's do a command B to make sure everything is copacetic. It is cool. So now this is the new syntax. You're maybe looking at this like it's hardly any different, like what's the point? However, now you can tack on like multiple trail enclosures. So this is just a quick little uh, example. Uh, I can tack on another label. Well, this is not gonna work for button, right? Let me actually show you a screenshot of uh, an example that actually works, right? But I wanted to show you what it looked like. So here on the screenshot from the WWDC, what's new in Swift, highly recommend checking that out as well. Here you can see that a gauge does have multiple uh, closures that you can tack on. You can tack on the current value label, minimum value label, maximum value label, but you can see how you're just tacking on multiple trailing closures. And uh, the syntax is very clean uh, when you use it in Swift UI. Now let's move on to some Swift Package Manager uh, improvements. Again, feel free to click on these links here to do a deeper dive. I'm gonna keep it short here, but packages can now contain resources such as images and other data files needed at runtime. So that just allows people to create more, more robust Swift packages. And again, more Swift package improvements if you want to uh, dive in. And finally, introducing Swift on Windows. This was just released, as you can see, September uh, 22nd. Don't get me wrong, Swift is still very nascent on Windows, just the beginning. This is the first like ever officially supported release. So expect this to grow, uh, but it is very nice to see Swift spreading its wings. But um, bum uh, horrible. <laughs> but uh, it is nice to see Swift spreading out and you know going on to other platforms, right? And again, remember, Swift is only five years old. Like it's just the beginning, so so early. So that's what's new in Swift 5.3. If you like what I'm doing here, you like my presentation style, check out the website on the screen. I started creating my own courses. You can watch the first 10% or so for free to see if it's something you like. All right, we'll catch you in the next video.